Welcome to Feminine Roadmap Podcast. I'm your host, Gina Farrar. Each week, I bring you an inspiring conversation to help you navigate the challenges and changes of midlife so that you can not only survive, but thrive in your second half. Hello, Feminine Roadmappers. It is Gina here, and today we are going to be talking about honest medicine, information about treatments that could and should be the primary standard of care if big pharma wasn't ruling doctors prescribing positions. If you are someone who is looking for alternative treatments to your health issues, this podcast is for you. My guest today is Julia Shopik. She's a public relations consultant and a patient advocate. She's the author of Honest Medicine, effective, time-tested, inexpensive treatments for life-threatening diseases, and more recently, the power of honest medicine. So without further ado, I want to welcome you, Julia, to my program. Thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you for inviting me, Gina. It's, it's great to be here. Well, I'm excited about this topic. As I told you before we hit record, I have a lot of people in my life who are involved in homeopathic medicine, integrative medicine. I have people in my circle who are medical doctors as well as integrative medicine doctors, and I appreciate the balance that they bring to the medical conversation. So without further ado, I'd really like to know, please tell me what brought you to this mission and this message of honest medicine. Well... It's a long story, which I will try to truncate. <laughs> basically, um, I grew up in a medical family. My dad was a doctor, and he basically told me to stay away from the medical establishment. He did not like his fellow doctors. He did not like the way medicine was going. He said one day, and this was in the 60s, that he said that one day things are going to be so specialized in medicine that there'll be a doctor of the big toe. That was, that was his, his, yes, isn't that great? So I basically tried to stay healthy and tried to, you know, stay away from the system as much as I could. And then in 1990, my husband, who was 40 years old, was diagnosed with a cancerous brain tumor. And for the first few years, you would have thought that I would have been like oh, researching and very active. I was not at first because I got scared just like everybody else would. And I followed the doc we followed the doctor's advice. He had he had surgery, chemo, radiation. And then I realized, you know, the prognosis was was about three years maximum that he had to live. And he defied that prognosis even though I wasn't researching. And then finally I said he started to get every side effect of every treatment that he could have gotten. He got non-healing skin. He had hydrocephalus, which is water on the brain. He had to have several uh, surgeries to correct that. He had a, uh, believe it or not, a radiation-caused stroke. This was at the age of 41. And uh, just all sorts of things. Oh, seizures to beat the band. And I said, you better start researching. And I did. And he started to thrive. He started to feel good, which he had not been feeling, you know. And we found a nutritionist whose area was cancer and especially brain tumors. And her name was Dr. Jean Wallace. And she started to uh, get him on. He, he, she cleaned up his diet, which was pretty clean anyway, and uh, got him on supplements. And he started to do much better. And he started to do, to defy the odds here, you know, and uh, he ended up living 15 years, by the way, from from diagnosis. And uh, what I noticed, Gina, was that the doctors were not at all interested in anything we were doing. This didn't bother me as much as it should have, if you want to know the truth, because at least they weren't stopping me. But then something happened, which, which changed my whole attitude. And that was that he had a recurrence of the tumor in about 10 years down the road, in about 2000, 2001. And I knew he should not have a surgery because his skin had not healed before, you know, previously. But the doctor talked me out of that and into the surgery. And he had the surgery and guess who was right? His skin did not heal. And 
and they did eight additional surgeries in a vain attempt to make his skin heal. He got wor He had walked into the operation telling jokes. He ended up bedbound, severely brain injured, almost completely uh, paralyzed. And at that point, you know, I, I was I was frantic. And I have, you know, as, as you said in the intro, I'm a PR consultant. And through one of my clients, I met a doctor who told me about, he, he asked me what was going on. He knew me, by the way, before. I guess I should say that. He said, how are you doing? And I started to cry, which I try not to do, you know, in professional things. And I told him my, my husband's skin was not healing. He was in the hospital, you know. And he said, have you heard about Silver Lawn? And I said, Silver what? And he said, Silverlon, S-I-L-V-E-R-L-O-N. And he said, it is a, it, it's pieces of material that are impregnated with silver ions. And he said, it's, it's FDA approved for all non-healing wounds. And I jumped on it. You know, I asked for, I, I, first of all, he hooked me up with the, with the salespeople and, and they came over, they were lovely. And uh, I said, I said, I, they told me about the inventor of it, of the product, Silverlawn, Dr. Bart Flick. And I said, no, 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 I want to talk with him. So I did. I called him and it was a miracle kind of thing that happened because I got my husband's neurosurgeon on the phone at the same time. I don't know how I did that. It must have just been, uh, you know, luck or providence or whatever. And I don't know if you, well, you probably do know that hospitals do not want to approve the use of something that, but they did approve it. Amazing. And, and Dr. Bart Flick donated the silver lawn to my husband and taught me how to put it on because it's not as easy. You know, you have to put it on. It goes by the idea of energy medicine. You have to put it on over the wound and it has to like, you know, take the healing potential of the good skin. And, and, you know, that's all in honest medicine. I write about it because I'm not the scientist, but Dr. Flick tells all about it in honest medicine. Skin started to heal the day after. And what I found, Gina, was shocking. I was so excited. I mean, here he was, he was brain injured and he was, you know, almost paralyzed, but I loved him and he was my husband. And, you know, I thought the doctors would be excited because here was something that could help other patients. You know, it's the dirty little secret of neurosurgery that if you have radiated skin and you operate again, it may not heal. It's going to have a hard time healing. Radiation is the gift that keeps on giving, you know. And so I, I couldn't understand why the doctors weren't excited, you know. And one doctor explained it to me. He was a resident. He, he had liked me a lot before this. And he said, we don't think, we meaning the doctors and he, don't think it's what you used on your husband that healed his skin. And I was like, so I, I believe me, I, I said, well, what do you mean? I said, you know, it's healing. He said, well, 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 we think it was the vancomycin. And that's the IV antibiotic, in case your listeners don't know, that my husband had been on for at least six weeks. So I pointed that out. And he said the words that, that you asked me what my, you sort of asked me what my aha moment was. He said, vancomycin is like that. It kicks in. I'm pausing. Because I was, I didn't know what to say. I mean, do you say you're an idiot? You know? <laughs> And, and you know what, if you say that, they're going to kick you out of the hospital, you know, and I didn't want to leave my husband. So I knew from that day forward that something was very wrong. And I knew that anyway. Remember, my father had told me that, you know, from being a little kid, you know, but I knew that I had that I had to do something about it. Well, the next three and a half years were spent trying to bring my husband, you know, to get better, but he was too damaged, but he was still funny and still, you know, humorous, although he often didn't know where he was, you know, and uh, I kept thinking, there must be other treatments like Silverlon that doctors don't know about, and even if they do know about, they're not particularly fond of or inclined to learn about, and I was not interested, Gene, in anything that was for a cold or something like that. 
it had to be something that was good for life altering conditions for and it had to be a life saving treatment so ironically and we don't want to get into this but i do want to say i had learned about these other three treatments you know silver line is the first one i had learned about the other three treatments while researching for my husband i i'm a dynamite researcher you know and i just said oh these are the treatments you know and i started to research and i decided that people telling their own stories was the best way to put together a book that a scholarly book is no damn good excuse my french if people aren't interested and i know you've read my book and these aren't these stories wonderful i mean they're just you know they're they're so real that is what my book is about and that's what my mission is about and there you go Absolutely. I think most things come out of a need that's unmet, right? Answer. Yeah. Yeah. So seeking what we yeah. don't have. We seek the answers and the solutions. I, I do find it frustrating. Um, I shared with you that I advocate for both my mother and my mother-in-law. And I do find I'm having varied experiences. My mother has a couple of eye doctors in a prominent hospital here in Southern California that are fantastic and they are talking with me and they're, you know, they're partnering with me and I'm finding that there's this great experience. But on the other hand, with my mother-in-law, everybody wants to hand her off to someone else and everybody kind of poo-poos my, you know, there's a lot of poo-pooing of my questions or yeah, yeah. poo-pooing of my ideas about the situation. And Part of this is because they are elderly, I do feel like the medical community is less interested in caring for them. Almost well, almost totally disinterested. Which is extremely frustrating, especially for someone who's caring for two of them. But aside from that, when we talk about alternative treatments, I have a couple of people in my life who've gone alternative with their cancers and have been very successful, but they were shunned by the medical community and were told if they took that path, they would get no help. So there is, yeah, yeah. There is a need for the support of those people who instinctively and intuitively realize that their bodies need not more chemicals, but healing, true healing. And so tell me about, you know, you have low cost, innovative treatments that work besides silver lawn. What are some other treatments? And on a side note, I know that IVs involved. Yes. IV treatments. I actually have someone in my life right now that was diagnosed with cancer and they are doing IV treatments, but I would really like you to share with the audience what that is and what that entails. You're talking about the IV treatment that, that, that I wrote about. Ah, that is intravenous alpha lipoic acid. And uh, Dr. Bert Berkson is the gentleman who literally was the pioneer um, of, of uh, intravenous ALA. And the story, I can briefly tell it, is that he was an intern and at a very prestigious hospital. And by the way, intravenous ALA, I should start by saying, is a treatment for end-stage liver disease and many cancers, okay? And autoimmune diseases. It's, it's just a, a, a healthful treatment. And he was a, as I said, an intern. And these people came into the hospital who had mushroom poisoning and their liver was failing poisonous mushrooms can shut down the liver. And, you know, he was told, you're going to love this, by his superiors that these people, these, this couple is going to die. So your job is to just watch them die and chronicle how it happens. Now, Dr. Berkson said, you know, he was both an MD and a PhD. He said, the PhD in me would not let this happen. And so he called up Dr. Fred Barter at the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, and he said, is there anything out there that can regenerate organs, you know, especially the liver? And Dr. Barter said, as a matter of fact, I can't believe you're calling about this at this time because we're just working on intravenous alpha lipoic acid. 
And it's great for diabetic neuropathy, but we also found while we were doing the studying, studying of it, that it regenerated organs and especially liver. Would you like to try it? He said, absolutely. So it was sent by, by airplane. He picked it up at the airport without asking for permission. I have to say that he infused it into these two patients. And guess what? They came around their livers started regenerating. Now you would have thought, Gina, that the doctors, remember the silver lawn story that I just told? Wouldn't you have thought that the doctors would have been delighted? No, they were furious at him. They said, you disobeyed us. You did something you were not supposed to do. I'm laughing, but I'm laughing to keep from crying as that old spiritual says, you know. And then the next weekend, other, oh, he was told never ever to do this again. Next weekend, another other people came in and he did it again with the same results. And as he said, he said, my goose would have been cooked if Fred Barter, from remember from the NIH, hadn't been so excited about this that he came and started working with me, you know, on studies and, and all of this. You know, they did a study of, I think, 65 patients with end-stage liver disease and 60 of them recovered, you know. So they couldn't fire him, you know. <laughs> but. Dr. Berkson knew that his goose was going to be cooked if he stayed in conventional medicine. So he, he retired from that and he started his own practice, which he's been happily doing in Las Cruces, New Mexico for many years and helping people. They come from all over the world and even some doctors come to him, but they will not admit it publicly as far as I know. But the good news is that he still, he, that now his son is also working with him, Arthur Berkson, and they are helping many, many people. And two of the stories in, in Honest Medicine, in my, in my first book, Honest Medicine, one is by Mary Jo Bean, who had terrible liver disease, you know, combinations, and she was, she was made well. And also a case of pancreatic cancer. And this is something that I just wish there weren't a blackout. Because as you know, the medical establishment is not very good with pancreatic cancer. No way, no how. And Dr. Berkson has like a 50%. I'm not going to say he's, he's 100% because that's a real hard one, you know. But he does have a, a 50% rate. And people who go there live longer. And so that is the story of Dr. Berkson and intravenous alpha-lipoic acid. You know, you talk about alpha-lipoic acid. I've been in the beauty industry for 30 plus years, has been an ingredient in skincare for years. Really? I did not know that. Yes. So you know, doc, Dr. Berkson and I are friends. I'm going to call him and ask him if he knew that. Yeah. So I'm like alpha lipoic acid. Like I've heard that before. I feel like it's meant for um, regenerating and hydrating. Yes, yes, yes. How funny. Seriously. I didn't like, know. Yeah, it's just skincare ingredients that are stuck in my brain from all those years. And intravenous. Yeah, this would be topical, which it would have a completely different effect, I'm sure, because, you know, topically and into straight into your system, it would go to the cells on a different level. Yes, yes, it does. Yeah. And uh, he's, okay. he's found that it works in many autoimmune diseases and, you know, it just regenerates, as you just said. Yeah. You know? I love it. That's so fun. That's a nice crisscross of my life and yours now. Yes. And by the way, so it's not really alternative medicine. You're absolutely right because it has to be infused. So you can't, you know, just go out and get it at Whole Foods or whatever, or, or whatever. But it is a right. gent, it's a gentler, it's an alternative to the treatments that the doctors use that just don't work in, in many cases. Mm -hmm. Now, I do know that there is a cancer facility, I want to say it's also Arizona, that I've heard about that has does a lot of that flooding of the system mm -hmm. and replenishing it through IV. So I've heard about that for years, and there are, and a lot of people have gone on to live very, very healthy life with these integrative alternative ways, but they're treating the body as a system. And They're not just the symptoms. Exactly. And I yeah. think that's the key is looking at our bodies as a whole. And what when one part is sick, other parts are affected. It's not, it's not a one, it's not like you, you can't segregate your body like that, right? Yeah. 
No, that's what my father was so worried about. He, I before the show we were talking about that. My father said one day they'll. He was a general practitioner. Uh, but one day there'll be a doctor of the big toe, and there we go. Yeah, exactly. It's it's hard to get answers. Now, I've had a couple of people on talking about the ketogenic diet. I'm interested to hear from your perspective because we're talking about alternative or integrative treatments for life-threatening diseases. Most people, when they do ketogenic diet, they're just trying to get things back into balance or they're just trying something new. So let's go that step further and talk to me about how the ketogenic diet fits into the topic of honest medicine. Okay, I'd love to. And by the way, I'm going to say before I tell the story of the ketogenic diet for ep pediatric epilepsy, and now, by the way, it's being used for cancer as well, um, I w I'm going to say that the gentleman that I'm going to be talking about, uh, Jim Abrams, people would not be knowing about the ketogenic diet for health reasons and all that if it hadn't been for Jim Abrams, okay? Uh, but basically, it is a treatment that was first developed it was used from the 1920s as the standard of care at places like Johns Hopkins and the Mayo Clinic for, for epilepsy. And it was very effective. I think, I think the, the statistic is 67% effective, you know, and that's, that's, that's a, good, a good result. And um, so it, but it fell out of favor when, guess what? Anticonvulsants came on the market, starting with Dilantin. And, uh, you know, starting with, and, and it, they just fell out of favor because it's much easier to prescribe a pill, right? Well, then in 1994, Jim Abrams, you probably know about Jim Abrams because he is the writer, director, producer of that, of that funny movie, Airplane, that's still a classic, yeah. right? And he has this great sense of humor. And one day in 1994, something happened to, to the Abrams family, which was very unfunny. And that was that the baby, Char his name was Charlie, started to come down with intractable seizures. That means seizures that wouldn't stop. One started, then stopped, then the next went, you know. And the doctors were putting him on one anti-seizure medication and two anti, he was on, I think, three or four at once. The introduction to Jim's chapter in Honest Medicine in my book is a doctor's quote as to how this kid was SOL, you know, out of luck and was going to become a vegetable. But his main thing was that he had to be on many medications and even had brain sur had to have brain surgery. And that was his only hope. And Jim said, to my everlasting shame, I let them do the, do the surgery. And the thing was, Gina, that he came out, little Charlie came out of the surgery and had a seizure right away. And at that point, Jim said, enough. And he went, this was before the internet, you know. By the way, several subheadings of, of the chapters in Honest Medicine are, thank God for the internet. But this was before the internet. So Jim went to the library and he started doing researching, you know, research. And he found this diet that had been long ago, you know, as I said, 1920s. And he was so excited. He started copying, you know, all of the pages and he brought them to the doctor and the doctor said, oh, no, don't, don't do it. Don't do it. It, it won't work. And that's when Jim said he let them do that surgery. I got a little bit chronolo chronologically out of place. And as I said, he, the, the child started seizing right away and he said enough. And he took Charlie to Johns Hopkins where Millie Kelly, who was like a famous uh, a dietitian who was known for the ketogenic diet, she put little Charlie on, on the diet and his seizures stopped and they never came back. And he now has finished college. And by the way, the thing about the ketogenic diet for epilepsy is for some reason, most kids only have to do it for two years. And then they can go and eat all the crap again, unfortunately, you know, I say unfortunately because, you know, but, but it's true. And so Jim decided, you know, Jim was from the entertainment industry, as I said, he said, I got to be able to do something. And he did. One of his good friends was Meryl Streep. And she did the educational video that was about how to use the ketogenic diet. And while this video was being made, 
um, one of the people who was on, who had been hired to produce the video, also worked for D Dateline NBC. He started. He said, "This is a great story. This is a great story." So he called Dateline NBC and he says, "I got a, I, have I got a story for you?" And Dateline NBC said, "This is great." And they put, they told Charlie's story. It's still on YouTube. And they told Jim's story and Charlie's story, and that's when all hell broke loose. Jim got so many letters, they filled a whole room. He had to dedicate a room to the letters he had gotten. One of the letters was from a woman who had had a similar problem, you know, where she could not get the treatment. She could not get the ketogenic diet. She actually had learned about it. But then, you know, anyway, Jim did a made-for-TV movie. It was about the ketogenic diet and this woman, Connie Intermitty, Intermitty. And Connie's role was played by, guess who? Meryl Streep. And you can still see that. It's called First Do No Harm. And so that is the story. Jim now is responsible for this diet to be all over the world for kids with epilepsy. And by the way, it works for adults with epilepsy, but adults are harder to control because with children, the parents make the meals and give them to the children, you know, uh, but uh, adults often will do a modified version of it. And by the way, now it is being used also for uh, cancer, but not totally, but as an adjunctive, a, an add-on treatment for cancer. And uh, when John McCain was diagnosed with a glioblastoma, I did an article that was on my site and I went on radio programs talking about other treatments for cancer and especially glioblastomas. And one of them was ketogenic diet. And there have been lots of books written about it for cancer, loads of books written about it for, for, uh, for epilepsy too. And now it's being used for weight loss and all everything. So I have a friend actually whose son has been having seizures since he was one. Yeah. And he's 10 now. And when they switched to the ketogenic diet, um, it reduced his seizures. But yeah. he's one of those that has seizures that, you know, normally they're kind of centered in one area of the brain. He's one yeah. of those small percentage where there's no pattern. They can't figure out what's causing them because they're all over his brain. There's no pattern. Uh -huh. There's no rhythm. But the ketogenic diet has been very successful with him. So when they use that, it really does help them. It has unfortunately not completely cured, but I understand the whole seizure medicine conversation because yeah. you know, she has shared a lot of that with me. And then I have a friend who died from glioblastoma. That is, um, that has almost, you can't, what's the survival rate on that is like less oh, than 3% or something crazy. The survival right? rate is very, very upsetting because when, you know, my husband, Tim had an astrocytoma three, grade three, which was one grade below the glioblastoma. So I'm pretty up on the statistics. They have not changed. They've changed only by months since my husband was first diagnosed. And it's, I think the survival rate is now 14 months using the standard of care. That's exactly what John McCain made it. I think he made it a year, maybe 12 or 13 a month or something like that. And that's why I get so upset that the doctors won't look into other things. So if anybody is interested in my article that I wrote, I think the title was, my husband lived 12 years beyond his prognosis. What does this have to do with John McCain? <laughs> okay. And uh, it was written obviously as an attempt to get to the McCain family and hopefully prolong his life. I remember watching that journey for her. As soon as she told me what she had, I went to the internet yeah, very grim. Um, I know her daughter did a lot of juicing things, but she had been with another prominent cancer hospital as a, um, she was the person that people would donate their estates to, and she took care of large donations. So she had excellent doctors at her fingertips as soon as she found out that she had it. And it's such a difficult process when somebody has a life-threatening disease fear. You said it yourself. The first thing that happens yeah. is you're afraid. And we turn to those that we trust, the people that we see as the experts, because we have no choice. We don't know. And they scare you off to doing any of your own research. And to, to some degree, I understand because information is not always right. 
and it's not always good information. And that's coming from the experts and from the yeah. so-called experts on the internet. So how do you help someone navigate that? Obviously, you've done the research and you've written a book that's been written by experts. So that helps a whole lot. Right. <laughs> so this right, is right. a great resource. But fear. Let's talk a little bit about when we're talking about honest medicine, how does someone have the courage to stand up to the business of medicine? It's very, very difficult. And you, you actually do best when you don't need the doctors to be on, uh, 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 with you. Unfortunately, with things like the glioblastoma, you know, there were several things I, I, in my article that I've said I'd be happy to send to people. By the way, my email is julietonestmedicine.com if, if you want to see that article. But um, the, the treatments, you know, you can do nutrition without your doctors. You know, you can hire Gene Wallace or another, you know, nutritionist. You could do that. But with, with one, another one that we're going to be talking about in a few minutes, low-dose naltrexone, you need a doctor's prescription. And you need a doctor. You need, with the ketogenic diet, you, you really shouldn't do it on your own. You need, you know, you need some advice, you know. And, uh, you know, there are all sorts of, of things that, yeah. Oh, and one of them. Oh, my goodness. It's not one of the things I write about, but it is in that article I was telling you about that I wrote about John McCain. Um, repurposed drugs. They're finding that a lot of medications are really, really effective against cancer. They were approved for other reasons, but they are effective. And, and this man named Ben Williams, uh, there's a movie out there that I highly recommend so, called Surviving Terminal Cancer. He used a bunch of these off-label medications uh, for his glioblastoma, and he's been alive for, I think, 25, 30 years now. So you asked the question. I'm not sure I answered it because the answer really is that you often need to find other doctors. And in, in, oh, in Ben's case and other people, on the thing, they actually lied about their symptoms like one of the one of the uh drugs that is known to be anti-cancer you know is accutane so one of them said i have bad acne you know and the doctor said you don't look like it but okay i'll give you accutane you know so it's 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 not easy because you often the, as you pointed out the doctors are often very rigid and by the way especially in these very prestigious institutions they're afraid of stepping outside the box because they will be criticized. I think it's fair to, for lack of a better term, defend some doctors who really do want to live by the Hippocratic Oath and heal and help yeah. people. But they are also part of a system yes. that unless they're willing to just jump and go another way, they have repercussions as well. And it, it puts them in a difficult position. It does. I do have a guest that I spoke to and she was part of a group and she was one of eight doctors and she thought, this is my business. I'm going to do this until I retire. And she was doing alternative treatments, you know, integrative medicine. And one day she walked in and one of the other doctors was calling her patients and telling them not to come in, that their appointments had been canceled. Oh my God. So she, it was her versus seven doctors and they were oh. like, oh Sorry. So she had to walk away from her own practice as a, oh from this medical group. And she had to start all over again. You know, her husband challenged her. It's like, well, you know, what are you going to do here? So um, the blessing of doing my podcast is all of the different people that I've met and spoken to and the stories that I've heard and how life-changing they are because there are those brave doctors who are willing to say, you know what, I've got my MD, but I also know that I've got this integrative path that I've learned, studied, gotten degrees. Like this is not, they're not like reading a book in the backseat of their car. They're being trained yeah. and they're able to treat people Eastern and Western, right? Right. Their whole body. And it, and it works. I think you mentioned that people, when we went from ketogenic diet to the anti-seizure medicine, I think there is a desire to come up with these things to help people. The problem comes when they will not be open to other things that are supplemental or helpful as well. Yeah. When they stick you on a path and will not listen. Um, the challenges that it is to take control 
of your own medicine. I know. You know what I mean? Your yeah. own body and, and the treatment. Because I think there are those doctors out there that are trailblazing and they're making huge oh, there are. differences, but they're just not as readily available. And they're overwhelmed when people finally decide to take that path. I mean, there's one here, there's a, a female doctor that I've spoken to. She's local to where I live and she's just so busy because yeah, yeah. it takes longer. This was my point that I'm slowly moving away from and trying to come back to. There's no quick fix when you use something like honest medicine because we're working with our body systems. Food is medicine. These other things are rebuilding the system. They're fighting. It's, it's not covering anything up. You're actually restructuring your body, healing your body, flushing your body. So I think that people who are used to the pharma solution, which is take this and you won't feel X, Y, and Z. Now yeah. you might lose your arm. You might lose your eyesight. You might be vomiting every day, but Hey, your first symptom is gone. Right. <laughs> can, and, and we've got other drugs to take care of those side effects. Right. So you end up in this cascade <laughs> of pharmaceutical medicine yeah. and you don't even know what you feel anymore. Whereas when you go a more natural route or a more, let's call it an honest route where you're taking the time to listen to your body. The doctor's getting to know your body and you're getting a very specialized treatment for you, not the blanket treatment that everyone with different bodies in different systems are getting. It takes time. And I think that's the thing that might hitch people up a little bit. They just want it fixed because of the fear or the, we're used to the quick fix, but honest medicine, I think, I mean, it can work quickly if you will, but, I think it's a different way of approaching treatment. It is. It is. It's definitely a different way. So when you're, when you're dealing with the mental shift from take this pill to follow this protocol, I think that's the shift. Is it not? I think so. It, it is the shift. And it's also the shift from just following doctor's orders to going on the internet, which doctors are not crazy about, by the way. There's a cup out there that's on Facebook all the time. Something about Dr. Google it's not, does not have an MD degree or something like that. So there's a lot of uh, prejudice against your going and doing your own research. But everyone in, in Honest Medicine and also in The Power of Honest Medicine, my, my next book, every single one of them came to these treatments on their own. They were not given them by their doctors. And we're talking about, you know, there's many, many stories, you know, it's, it's kind of upsetting, but uplifting at the same time. How does that sound? Do you know what I mean? It's very exciting to me that people are going outside the box. And, and also you mentioned the doctors in, in the next treatment, the the fourth treatment that I write about low dose naltrexone. um, I have to tell you that there are now over a thousand doctors worldwide who are prescribing low-dose naltrexone for autoimmune diseases. And this is quite something. And this was a people-driven movement because I don't know if you're active on Facebook, Gina, but there are over 30 groups devoted to low-dose naltrexone on Facebook. I mean, it's it's just, I call it a cause celebra. It really caught on. And that probably is because there are more autoimmune diseases in this world than just about any other kind of disease, including cancer. So, you know, people are suffering and they're going from doctor to doctor to doctor because there's no one doctor that knows about autoimmunity. So they're going from this doctor to that doctor and they're going to five, six, seven, eight doctors and they're waiting. But anyway, um, do you want me to tell you about, about low dose naltrexone? Yes, that's actually one that I haven't heard about. So I'm really interested to learn a little bit more. Okay, I'm delighted to teach you. And, uh, you know, I'm a former teacher. I forgot to say that in the intro. But uh, to tell people about it, this is another doctor. You know, we complain about doctors, but this, but there are several. I, I talked about Dr. Berkson. Now there's another Dr. B, Dr. Bahari, Bernard Bahari, and uh, who is now deceased, unfortunately. But Dr. Bahari was a doctor who was working with people with HIV AIDS. And a lot of them, of course, were drug addicts, you know, and he, so he ran, he was a big shot. He went to Harvard and, and Columbia and got, you know, he, he had all the five-star degrees, double board certified, 
in uh, neurology and psychiatry had publications all over the place. Every scholarly journal would publish his things, you know, until what I'm about to tell. So in 1984, he was working with drug addicts and this, this medicine came on the market called naltrexone, not low dose naltrexone, high dose naltrexone. It was approved in 1984 for uh, drug addiction. And then again in 1994 by the FDA we're talking about for alcohol addiction. And again, at high doses. And Dr. Bahari, I, you know, he, as I said, he, well, I didn't say, he ran all the methadone clinics in New York. He really was a heavy hitter, uh, you know, at one point. And when he heard about naltrexone, he's like, oh my God, I, I will try this, you know, because it's hard to get people. So he gave some of his patients naltrexone and it was to stop the, it was to stop the craving for the opioids, for the heroin. And he said it worked, but unfortunately, the dose was so high that was FDA approved that, that he said, he, the way he put it was, he said, things that they could do the day before, they couldn't do anymore. You know, they were so hopped up. So he said, but something is happening. They, they, they didn't even know about HIV AIDS at this point. It was just known as the gay people's disease or drug addict's disease, you know. And he noticed that their disease was not progressing. So he said, wait a minute. How about if I lower the dose of this naltrexone and study it at every little level, you know, and see how low we can go so that we don't have these horrific side effects anymore, but we still have the immune, he called it immune modulating, and that means making the immune system act correctly. So he got it down to, I think, four milligrams. And it still was, was working, and, and it was working for the drug addicts he was working with, you know, people with HIV AIDS. But then a woman, a young woman came to him. The, the urban legend is, I don't know if it's a true story or an urban legend, that she was a good friend of his, one of, of his daughters. And she had MS, multiple sclerosis. And at that point, there was no FDA-approved drug for multiple sclerosis. And she said, well, could I try it? And Dr. Bahari said, sure, nothing to lose, hardly any side effects, you know, of course. And her disease stopped progressing. Well, there was no internet, just like for, for Jim Abrams, you know, with the ketogenic diet. And people think we had pen and paper and telephone, you know, and word spread. And people started coming to New York to, to visit with Dr. Bahari, people with lupus, people with Crohn's disease, people with fibromyalgia, you know, all different autoimmune diseases. And by the way, there are now over a hundred of them that have been chronicled. And I'm not going to say everybody experienced good results because it's not, you know, this is not, uh, this is not snake oil but a good percentage had very, very good results. So now, I mean, this has been going on for years. And as I said, uh, loads of, loads of uh, people on, on the internet, there are Yahoo groups and, you know, people are spreading the word. Even, this is great, some of the patients actually collected money for a clinical trial. And all they could raise was like 25,000, which, you know, doesn't do, I don't know if your listeners know, but clinical trials with the double blind and all that stuff really are in the billion dollar category. And the only ones who can, who can afford it are pharmaceutical companies. So they pay the money. But anyway, this is not what LDN is about. It's called LDN, low dose naltrexone. So these patients uh, paid for a trial. And of course, it turned out well, it was at the University of California, San Francisco. And uh, there have been small trials done at, at all sorts of places, including Stanford for fibromyalgia. Jared Younger did several studies about fibromyalgia at Stanford. And uh, Jill Smith did uh, several studies about Crohn's disease. And it's been really getting, but the question is, will there ever be one of those large scale, double blind, billion dollar studies of low dose naltrexone, I don't think so, because there's two. There's a, a flip side about this. One of them is, what pharmaceutical company want to put all that money into something that this inexpensive? I didn't tell you, but it's less than forty dollars a month to get it on your own. You know, less than copays for a lot of the dangerous drugs that people are taking for their autoimmune diseases. You know, much less than the copays. So. 
the main thing in, in Honest Medicine, there is a chapter by uh, Dr. Bahari's colleague, David Gluck, and he talks about this whole thing of the pharmaceutical companies running, you know, the clinical trials. And so the answer is that probably, in my opinion, there won't be a clinic, you know, big, 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 big clinical trials. On the other hand, if there were, how much do you think it would cost? Could you still get low dose naltrexone for $40 a month if pharma did the trials? I don't think so. I think that you would not. As a matter of fact, Dr. Bahari's widow, Jacqueline Young Bahari, told me she hasn't gone public, but he was in conversation, Dr. Bahari was, with a pharmaceutical company to do a clinical trial. And uh, he was ready to sign. He had his pen out, you know, and he was going to sign. And he said, oh, by the way, how much are you going to charge for it? And I think they said something like a few thousand dollars a month. And he said, no deal. So, you know, because this is going to make it so that people can't afford it. It's now still available. You have to get it through your doctor. And most doctors are not convinced, you know, but we do have a list. Thank goodness for a, for a patient advocate named Crystal Nason, who has put together a list of these thousand doctors worldwide. We can't publish it online because these doctors don't want to be, you know, most of them. But we can, you know, I can give the names of people in your in your state. And by the way, I want to give a, a shout out to a woman named Linda Elzegood, E-L-S-E-G-O-O-D, in Britain. And her website is ldnresearch.org. And she is incredible. She has put together, I mean, conferences almost every year. She, her story is told in both Honest Medicine and in The Power of Honest Medicine. I, I, made, I made the decision to include one person's story in both books, which I didn't do except for her. And she has a radio show. Go to her website, listeners, go and, and you'll be thrilled because she has radio shows dedicated doctors talking about their successes, patients talking about their successes. And she's done, I call her the en Energizer Bunny because she, her MS was actually kept in, you know, I don't want to say remission, but yes, remission through LDN. So that's the story of LDN. You know, it's interesting. I think a lot about these autoimmune diseases, oh. Julia, and there's just a, uh, an amazing amount of them coming up. People are so impacted by autoimmune diseases, and it does make one wonder what is out of balance in our world that's causing people's bodies to go off the rails because that's what an autoimmune disease is. It's our yes. bodies fighting against itself as if it's the enemy. Yeah. And so it's really interesting that all that is happening. Now I noticed that you have a topic, you know, listening to your gut. Let's talk yeah. a little bit about empowering ourselves to trust ourselves in this process. It's probably one of the most difficult things in the world because as I, well, I described, you know, when my husband was sick, did I listen to, and my father should have been in my mind saying, don't listen to these doctors. I won't tell you what he called them because he'd shut me off the air. But uh, even I fell into lockstep. So it's very, very hard to even know what your gut is trying to tell you because your gut can be saying, well, I don't know, you know, the doctor's. But essentially, it is important to, to listen to your gut. The main thing I would say is listen to your gut when, when you feel that something is not right. Do you know what I mean? Go online. Get, get more education. And uh, don't, don't listen to the doctor who says, don't do that. You know, It's very difficult. Yes, that is my, that is my message. But I'm not going to say it's easy. Mm. There is something to be said for that sense we have when something's not right. Yeah. You know, it's hard to explain, but I think the more you move toward alternatives to treatment in your body, the more you know yourself, the more you're in tune with the rhythms of your life. You know how we all have like energy cycles. Sometimes we have more energy, sometimes we have less, right? Right. Our right. bodies do have a rhythm. And once we become more in tune with, man, I just, I feel like I need to move or I feel like I just need to rest, right? We go, 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 go. But sometimes when we become more in tune, I think we are more able to listen to our gut. That's, that's true. We're developing a relationship with ourselves, essentially, right? Yeah, yeah. 
But we do have to fight not only the medical profession, I don't mean to come in with it, but, but the media. And that is a big point. I, I have an afterword in The Power of Honest Medicine. And if people would like to, to see, I can send them just that chapter if they're interested about the power of the media and what is going on, because we don't even get the full story in the media. Do you know what I'm saying? Any of the stories that they say about the courageous people with cancer are going to be about how they withstood chemo and radiation. They're not going to be how they use these treatments that go against what the doctors say. So the media in this country really does rule. In a, so you got the combination of the doctors and the media and, and, oh, and the media does it this way because who are their sponsors? Big Pharma. And if you get a magazine, like say People, you know, that loads of people would read, oh my God. And how many of the ads do you think are for pharma and how many pages filled? So it's very hard with everything going on to just say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to follow my gut, but it's important that you do, that we do. Yeah. There's a certain courage that's involved in the process of taking ownership of your own body. Yeah. And, and I do think for some people, they don't have to go off the rails and not go to any doctors at all. But I was speaking to another guest and it was a heart doctor and he was busting heart health myths. That's what he does. He's right. Busting those myths and saying, no, these, this is the truth about these tests. This is the truth about most heart situations are not dire, but he was really laying out a map for how to partner with your doctor and what to do if they don't want to partner with you. And he's a doctor. He's basically saying, this is what a doctor who cares about you would behave like. Yeah. And this is what a doctor who's just doctoring is going to do. And I, and I think his voice is in my head saying, you have the right to ask the questions. And if they won't listen to you, find another doctor. And that is great, except for if you're in the midst, like my poor husband was leaking cranial fluid. You know, I couldn't say, okay, we're leaving. No, no other doctor would take him as a patient. Hmm. Do you know what I mean? When you're in a dire situation that was caused by a doctor who had been good for the beginning of the treatment. Do you know what I mean? It's not like we, but just failed, you know, and I even tried to get him with another doctor and, and everyone was saying, we will not take Dr. X's patient. I'm like, he's my husband. Do you know what I'm saying? So often it's hard to change doctors, but you're absolutely right that if at all possible, uh, that's what you should do. Isn't that what we're talking about, though? There is no 100% solution, 100% answer, 100% success. But I kind of have a mantra in my life that if I know that something doesn't work over here. Yep. My philosophy is, well, shoot, if it's not going to work over there, I'm going to try something different. Absolutely. In other words, if this is a guaranteed failure, whatever this is, why not try something different? Why not yeah. give something else a shot? And, and it's a gamble either way, because if we're looking at survival rates of less than, what do you say, 14% or something like that, and you know- yeah that this is the guaranteed survival rate, wouldn't you want to maybe be at a 20% or 22%? And I think that's where the courage comes in to really step outside of the proverbial box. And, and of course, we're not doctors. So this podcast is just a stimulating conversation about thinking differently, maybe giving yourself some space to consider there are other things out there and we still at this moment live in a free country here in America and may be able to flex our freedom muscles in the benefit of our health yeah. at this moment in time. And this is just an encouragement or um, another piece of the conversation to broaden our understanding of what is out there currently being used and being successful. It's something it's good to educate ourselves. So of course, the disclaimer is we're not saying all doctors are bad, don't go to doctors, don't take medicine. But we are saying if something in you doesn't feel comfortable with that, this is an opportunity to educate yourself and get more knowledge to add to the conversation. And if at all possible, 
find a doctor who will partner with you in the journey toward the wellness that you desire and that you deserve. Would yeah. you agree with that, Julia? Abs- absolutely. And uh, it's key. And there are more and more doctors willing to do this. So that's the good news. We are rounding our hour here. So if you had to kind of give people like three things to kind of anchor in some of these thoughts, whether it's empowering them in their own healthcare, whatever it is, what three things would you offer to our listeners today? Okay. The first one is follow your gut. Okay. I guess that's an easy one because that you kind of expect from me, but one that we sort of alluded to is it's a two part. It's uh, so that'll be three. It's to do your own research, but, and this is something I keep thinking maybe I should conduct uh, workshops on, frankly, knowing how to evaluate the research, because there's so much, you know, people, the doctor will say to you, there's so much crapola on the internet, and he or she is correct, but there's so much good information as well. And uh, the doctor will tell you to go to official sites like the Mayo Clinic or not necessarily. My advice, and I wrote an article about this that was, that was published, how to ch- separate the wheat from the chaff is what I think I called it, but it is to look at who is funding the treatment or in, in some cases, the articles. You know, if you re- go on the Mayo Clinic website and you read an article about this drug is terrific, you know, use it, blah, blah, blah. And then you do research on the author of the article and you see that he's been funded, you know, by, and it's very difficult. Sometimes they don't admit, they're supposed to admit what their ties are, but they don't always. Oh, also a lot of the organizations, like I'm going to say the American Cancer Society, the American MS Society, um, all of these societies, look at their sponsors. Their sponsors are going to be many drug companies. And it's it's kind of a disease, you know, I I hate to use the word in this country. Now, the same thing goes for alternative treatments, because no treatment, if you read something saying this celery juice, you know, or whatever, cures all whatever kind of disease, nothing cures all of anything. And run like hell, as my father would say, from the medical profession, he used it then. But you've got to get so that you can, so that you don't get hooked up with things and you have to be just as careful with the tried and true places, you know, and I keep mentioning Mayo. I don't mean to do that because I'm talking about any institution or any of these medical societies, these disease societies, and the same thing goes with alternatives. So it's kind of a two part, uh, two, so that makes three. The second one that I gave was really a two-part answer. So, and that was to watch out for the financial ties of that go along with the treatment that you're reading about. And I can't stress this enough. And I'm saying it, for instance, when you're talking about the National Crohn's Disease Society, the National MS Society, they really are funded by pharmaceutical companies to a great degree. So don't not take their advice. Don't stop reading their articles, but keep in the back of your mind that there could be some financial thing going on. But the same thing goes for a lot of alternative treatments that if you see anything that says this cures all diabetes or all such and such, no, no, no treatment does that. So those are my, uh, those are my uh, one and then a two part And then I suppose I would also say, take the media with a grain of salt because they are funded as well. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, Julia, I want to thank you so much for having this stimulating and educational conversation with me and for my audience and just kind of expanding our perspective a little bit about some of these confusing topics because fear is a big part of making it difficult for us to step outside the box. So I want to thank you and honor you for being courageous enough to go against the grain and put your name out there on something that actually challenges the status quo. So thank you for the work that you do. Thank you so much for inviting me. I've enjoyed this tremendously. Wonderful. So today we've been talking with Julia Shopik. She's a public relations consultant, a patient advocate, and the author of Honest Medicine, Effective 
time-tested, inexpensive treatments for life-threatening diseases, and more recently, the power of honest medicine. If you head over to www.feminineroadmap.com forward slash episode 152, I will have links to Julia's books and the other websites that she suggested. So if you didn't get a chance to jot them down, just head over to that link, click there, and you'll be taken directly to the resource. Also, please leave your name and email address while you're at my website and become a part of my tribe. I periodically send out encouraging emails. My friends, this conversation is not meant to replace what you know. It's not meant to shame you for the decisions that you have made thus far. This conversation is just here to add to the conversation, to add perspective, a little more depth, and to get you to think about maybe something you didn't know. So this is your body, your life. It's your loved one's body and their life. Make the decision that is best for you, where you're at, with what you know. If this is helpful to you in any way, we are so grateful that you've taken the time to listen in and to consider reading these books and sharing this information because we have the right at this moment to still take control of the health of our bodies and our minds. So take this information, do with it what feels good for you. And thank you so much for taking the time to grab a cup of something wonderful and listen in on this conversation. We look forward to sharing more and more powerful conversations with you as time goes on. Take care, my friends. Bye-bye.